Hey, Evan. What's going on, Cam? Not much, man. Just enjoying a nice Halls cough drop. I've got the uh, cherry ones for throat soothing. I don't need it, but as we discussed off air, mm-hmm. uh, this is just this one's just a little treat. It's leftovers. That's a treat drop. I'm just enjoying it. I'm just like treat I, drop. Sometimes you just get used to the taste of a Halls after a meal, you know. Yeah. So uh, I uh, uh, we were talking before, and I had some. Um, New Jersey Michaels for dinner, mm-hmm. and um, you know I ordered through the app, the little the little app thing. Yep. And uh, so I just go in, I pick up my sandwich. It's already ready. I just grab it, and I'm walking out. And I'm on my phone. I'm texting you. Uh, this is while I was texting you earlier, and uh, also our friend who's uh, hosting our Magic Draft. Yeah. On Saturday, yep. just coordinating plans, and uh, all of a sudden I just hear some dude, and he's talking like this. By the way, he just goes. Man, everybody's door dashing these days. <laughs> and he's looking, like, directly at me. And, like, we're outside the store. And I just look up, and I'm like, I don't say anything. And then he just goes, everybody's door dashing these days. <laughs> just repeats it. And I literally just go, what? He goes, Are you, you- door dashing? <laughs> and I was just like. Uh, he goes, oh, you, you're just picking up? I'm like, y- yeah. Yeah. He goes, and he's like starting to walk away through the parking lot at this point, but he keeps looking back at me to continue this conversation. He goes, yeah, man, everybody's door dashing. And I'm just like I, I'm like, I have my phone in my hands. I'm not even sure what to say, so I'm just yeah. looking at him. And he goes, you door dash, right? I'm like, uh, yeah, I've, I've used door dash. He goes, wait, you drive for them? This is still the same guy. He's still just yeah, going. <laughs> yeah, he's just keep going. I'm like, I just look up. I go, nah, man, I'm just grabbing a sandwich. See, that's <laughs> the thing about where you live, man. And I mean, that shit can happen anywhere. But like, yeah. I feel like where you live, there's this so, wasn't so much more. Where was this? <laughs> this was uh, this was in Fairhaven. Oh, okay. Well, I was gonna. <laughs> he say. was a, he was a very New Bedford guy, though. He, he yeah, seemed like, yeah. Uh, this sounds like a very New Bedford interaction. I was just going to say, I feel like I've never had so many like unsolicited, unwanted social interactions as I've had when I lived or have spent time in New Bedford. Dude, yeah, like, that, yeah, you are dude. at least twice as likely to end up in a conversation that you don't want to be a fucking part of. Yeah, if you're if you're in that in city. My city, yeah. You know, yeah, like no, in Newton, no, absolutely. where I live, yeah. if you want to be left alone, it's pretty straightforward. You just you don't really make eye contact, and you just. You just go about your business. You know what yeah, I mean? I know. What, where I live, you're going to be yelled at about DoorDash, not have the chance to answer any questions. Yeah. And the person is just going to go through the well, whole the conversation is, at you. It's not about you. Yeah. None of that was about you. <laughs> you I, know? I said two words, and both of them were yeah. Yeah. To him. Right. Or, or no, sorry, what? Yeah or what? Right. Yeah, I mean, that's crazy. And to think, like, you, you're like, sir, I just want to enjoy this New Jersey I can't even enjoy the sandwich submarine now. sandwich. Yeah, I can't even enjoy this nice turkey sandwich anymore. Oh, you want the turkey? I think that I think that, that J. Mike's has the fucking best sliced turkey Yeah, I think Earth. we've actually literally talked about this on a different episode. Yeah, we which have. That's why I did want to bring this up now. We we're a, a, we're a... Turkey we're bacon, a... but you top it like it's an Italian. Add a little mustard, some pickles, but, you know... Yeah, I don't do the the to the bacon, but I yeah, uh, yeah, same same fucking thing with the hot relish and the. Oil. I get the oil and vinegar, but I also do mayo and mustard because it's turkey. It's I a sloppy the, sandwich. Yeah, I, I get do tomatoes. The mustard, on I, I don't do the mayo. I do the mustard, but not the mayo. I get tomatoes on mine too, so it's a fucking it's not a tomato. juice ball. You bite into that yeah. fucker and it drips. It's a juice ball. Yeah, I get a yeah, I get that's a just drippy wet sub. Wet and wriggling. <laughs> yeah, one drippy turkey, please. That's like basically <laughs> yeah, what it is. Yeah. It's a drippy. Yo. Sandwich. Drippy Cam's coming in. He wants one of his drippy turkeys. Dude, it's so good. And I also I also get um, the Parmesan bread. Yeah, of course. Oh. Everybody gets the Parmesan bread. Oh. It's, it, everybody gets the Parmesan bread. Nobody gets the regular there. J. Michael's Parmesan bread is the fucking yeah. absolute best. Jersey Miguel, yeah. Yeah, dude. Jersey yeah. Mike's. That's another one that I feel like, like that, and there's like a couple seltzer companies that I feel like we could convince Evan to take fucking corporate dollars from if they agreed to let us say whatever the fuck we want i feel like we could get evan to agree to be sponsored by jersey mics yeah <laughs> see that's not a no it wasn't an outright uh, no so you uh, could get me for waterloo seltzer yeah polar i would tell them to to kick rocks um polar's on the i don't know man polar's on the downswing for me really yeah i i pretty I much know. exclusively do uh wegman's brand and uh yeah. Uh, Waterloo. I'm a W. Yeah, Water, Waterloo's a good. Waterloo's 
Waterloo is on the come up. Pull you know what I had down. today that I never buy in bulk, but I will occasionally oh. get a single of? I had one of the flavored uh, liquid deaths, the uh, severed I've ne- lime. I've never had any liquid death. It's it's any. fine. Um, you know, it's 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 way overpriced. The branding though yeah. is like so impeccable. It's like for guys like you and me. Th- that no. seltzer exists because dudes well, like you and I are in the world. Well, especially sober guys or guys who don't drink. Like sure. Well, it's great. Like They'll have it at a lot of metal shows so I can have yeah. a tall boy at a show and feel normal. Because it's weird for me to have both of my hands by my side when there's rock and roll playing. I, I have a hard time with that. Yeah. I-, I need something. I need one arm at a right angle holding something cylindrical. Yeah. You know That will end up on the back of the guy in front of you. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> 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 I need to be holding a fat cylinder, and it's gonna end up on the back of the guy in front of me. Yeah, uh, I need to spill on the back of the guy in front of me. Oh my god, <laughs> my hot leavings. Um. So anyway, yeah. Oh, speaking of, we've got a fucking pretty metal April coming up. Yep, a lot of shows this year, guys. If you're metal fans, there's some tours coming around. I was talking about with some of my uh, mufos on Twitter today. A lot of a lot of metalheads in the uh, in the greater left on red community. But um, yeah, it seems that seems like that would be the case. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. No, uh, we we got a uh, dude. I'm I am so excited to see Creeping Death. Municipal waste, obviously, but I think Creeping Death is going to fucking tear the place down. Yeah, it's um, and also Sacred Reich, who's like old yeah. school thrash. They're from like that second wave like them and testament and like sacrament yep. and there were a bunch of bands a couple of the german bands like creator and whatever yeah um, sodom that were like that second wave of thrash you know after the bass scene exploded um yep. and sacred reich i'm particularly excited about because they have this track surf nicaragua which yeah. is i've already decided is my summer anthem because in spring i'm going to nicaragua which is going to be really exciting and uh so it's your spring anthem yeah so i get to, i guess so but i get to see surf nicaragua before i go and surf nicaragua now whether or not i actually am able to stand on a surfboard <laughs> has yet to be determined you can boogie so. board you can boogie yeah but boogie boarding is like the number one way to get eaten by sharks and they are bull shark central down there so i don't well, even yeah, know they also have fucking yeah they have uh, crocodiles down there too they got everything it's the straight up jungle yeah. and so they also have the one of the only like stable freshwater shark populations in the world because yeah. lake nicaragua is full of sharks and okay. uh you know, everybody knows bull sharks and certain other requiem sharks can kind of go back and forth, but Lake Nicaragua has sharks just all the time, and crocodiles, and fucking yeah. volcanoes, and you know, I'm too much of a fucking suburban white pussy, honestly, to even be I'll going. Be very interested in. Yeah, so we're gonna potentially like like bore. Like, he sort of sled down him sled down volcano on. Oh, well, like oh a, yeah, well, nice. Well, sounds fun. I don't know, man. It sounds pretty cool. Yep. But I'm I'm too lame for this kind of trip, honestly. But we're going to do it. We're going to go see. And so I figure I'll, I'll try to get some recordings down there that we can maybe incorporate into the podcast if it's good. I don't know. We'll see. Cool. Um. So this is going to be an interesting one. So I know not I mentioned really an episode. Few... What? Not really like a left and right episode. No, it's not. It's sort of a side project that I mentioned a couple weeks ago. Um. I've been working on uh, a dramatic reading of the sword and sorcery uh, anti-classic uh, The Eye of Argon uh, by Jim Theus, uh, which is a 1970 uh, piece of dog shit fantasy writing that's super fucking hysterical. And so I've been recording that and putting some sound effects and music and stuff to that. And... Um, you know, I mentioned sort of releasing that in parts, and so part one of that is this week. We're going to record – well, it's already recorded, and so we're kind of just – we're bookending that shit. Um, but that doesn't mean the world stops turning, and I think there's a few things that we wanted to kind of talk about before we dive into that. Yeah, like that freak outside Jersey Mike's. Well, that was definitely – Yeah. No. I think that was worth bringing up. I think that they need to know about that guy. <laughs> I, I need somebody you door to hear. dashing. Everybody is door dashing. Yeah, dude. Wouldn't be yeah. surprised to find out that that guy had like, a really fan. crazy story. That there's probably something really interesting about him. He's the biggest left on red fan. He's going to hear this. That would be very bizarre. That would be really yeah. odd if like that if there was backlash to this. 
Yeah. I mean, he was in a track suit, so it's 50-50 he listens, but... That's fair. Do you think we've got a lot of tracksuit wear? Like, I know we still have a lot of metalheads. I mean, we've got a tracksuit wearing host. Yeah, I mean, yeah, that's true. Yeah, yeah one of us does. I won't yep. say who, but... I bet they can go. Yeah. Ooh. <laughs> it's not me. It's me. Oh, <laughs> so, it's me. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, yeah. Uh, I think you also wanted to talk about the fucking... Yeah, so so when I mentioned the East Palestine thing last yeah. week, like it was still just kind of like unfolding. And uh, so I should say, this is something I at least know in the background something about. I used to be the the uh, hazmat manager for a uh, uh, for a testing facility, environmental testing facility. So I remember hearing about this, and when they said that there was vinyl chloride on the train, I was thinking to myself, I was like, "There's definitely gonna be some acrylates on there too." Vinyl chloride is used for like polymer production. Sure, it's like a precursor uh, chemical. And sure enough, it's released this week that, oh, it wasn't just vinyl chloride. There were, like, three or four other, like, pretty serious hazmat, um, dangerous goods. One of which was, uh, uh, ethyl hexyl acrylate, um, which is, you know, highly carcinogenic, uh, also used in the, uh, production of polymers, things like Teflon, all that kind of shit. So, um, uh, this shit is still burning, by the way. <laughs> like, the pictures, there are still pictures coming yeah. out, this shit is still burning, it's still going down. Yeah, controlled uh, the, release, right? Yeah. And, uh, you know, uh, I will say this about the EPA. You know, people talk about that the EPA is there and saying that's safe. The EPA has uh, all of the exact same data <laughs> that you get in, like, the EU. And now you should ask yourself, why is it that the EU is so much stricter about environmental releases and shit than the EPA if they both have access to the exact same data? I'm just saying, just like every other... Uh, uh, agency here in the United States. It's captured by special interests. Yeah. It is uh, hollowed out and absolutely at the whim of uh, whatever administration is in the White House. I remember when Donald Trump came in, he immediately uh, started allowing the sale of this chemical called chlorpyrifos, uh, which is like a super, super fucking toxic uh, um, pesticide. And, like, just immediately he comes in and put down pressure on them and they allow it again. It's because these things, they're political institutions, just like every institution in this country. Right. So uh, I would say just because the EPA is saying something safe, I wouldn't uh, assume that it is safe. I think the EPA maybe was better in previous days, but now, just like everything else in this country, it's hollowed out and uh, it is uh, politicized. So um, there was a town hall last night. Where, uh, in East Palestine, for concerned citizens, obviously you should be concerned, and a straight-up fucking Norfolk Southern <laughs> trail, the, the... Just to clarify, the, sorry, really quick, I want to jump yeah. in, because I don't think that we've reiterated it on this episode, and yeah. who knows if people listening are, are, are dummies, because I know that if I wasn't up on this, I would be confused. We're talking about East Palestine, Ohio. So yeah, just yeah. so you just so you're not confused oh, yeah. and like I know sometimes people are <laughs> like oh well you know it's half the world away and shit fucking weird shit happens over there. This is like It is a weird town name. It is, but it's also like <laughs> yeah. I mean it's no king of Prussia, but it's yeah. it's it's yeah. this is this is the heartland of like this country. So yeah, this is I, I know that yeah. seems obvious but I'm just to in yeah. case yeah, anyone listening is talking about the East on. Palestine uh, Ohio <laughs> train derailment. Right. So the company Norfolk uh Norfolk Southern uh, just strip doesn't show up to this town hall yesterday. Just strip does not show up to this yeah. town hall that was called for them to answer questions about concerned citizens, and then they say that they feared for the safety of, you know, the people who work for Norfolk Southern, which, good, um, right. <laughs> uh, and then and at this meeting where people are being told that it is safe, it's safe outside. There are further and further away are these huge like die offs of animal. Uh, you know, fish and birds are always going to be the first to die in these sorts of releases. Yeah, because they, they don't, don't have quite the. Yeah, they don't have quite the robust, uh, you know, systems to to break down these chemicals, uh, metabolic systems. You know, for instance, if you heat like you're not supposed to heat like Teflon, which is a polymer, you're not supposed to heat like a Teflon coated pan mm-hmm. without any sort of oil in it. If you have birds in your house, because yeah. they they'll die from the fumes way before. It's even toxic to humans. Right. So so fish and birds are always going to die first in these sorts of events. But the die-off is happening further and further and further and further away. There's, like, mass die-offs of, like, fish and shit in streams. Like, this is contaminating the watershed. 
And then uh, people at this town hall are straight up saying that they're waking up with, like, completely, like, fucked airways. Their children are breaking out in rashes. Like, people are getting sick. Yeah. And, you know, people have talked about, like, smaller mammals dying, like, their cats. And, like, some guy who is, like, a fox breeder, he says his fox, his fox are, like, dying and, like, trying to run away and breaking their legs. They're, like, in such a hurry. And, you know, and so, like, you know, smaller mammals are, start, are you know, dying as well. And people are getting sick as well. It's just, this is a complete fucking disaster. And the heartland yeah. of <laughs> the heartland of this country. Yeah. And uh, I think one of the craziest ones, and it's one of those things where it's like this synchronicity that you almost want to like go crazy about. So you know the author Don DeLillo. We yeah. talked about him. He did the book Libro that we talked about with uh, Patrick yeah, 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 yeah. on the JFK apps. He has a book called White Noise, which is about an airborne toxic. Yes, event. they just made a Netflix uh, movie of it. Yep. Which is filmed. In Ohio. Interesting. And some of the extras in the movie are from East Palestine. And those people have talked about it. They're like, yeah, we were extras in a movie, and we're now literally f- living through the thing that we would just act in a movie about. And it's like, you see shit like that, and it's like, enough to make your mind go fucking insane. Yeah. Yeah, it's cra- I mean, it's crazy. It's insane synchronicity. Yeah. That's like insane. I, well, I was thinking about that the other day, and I didn't do any reading into it. But I was like, "Oh yeah. man, didn't didn't White Noise just come out?" And I, you know, I I yeah. have not read or seen the movie, but I know like the basic. Same, idea. same, same. I haven't either. Um, and, but yeah, no, these people like were interviewed. I think by the New York Times or something like that. Yeah. Oh man, <laughs> man, that's that's fucking tragic. Yeah, that's I fucking mean, yeah, this bizarre. Is, this it's just is the kind like, of irony that uh, you know, it, it makes me think like um. I was watching an old episode of South Park the other day, which I very occasionally yeah. will do. <clears throat> and yeah. it was, you remember the episode Grey Dawn when all the elderly people are getting their licenses taken away? Yeah, because yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> And so at the very beginning, it starts and it's like a memorial service for somebody who's been killed by an elderly driver. And uh, what's the priest's name? Father? Oh, well, I don't remember. Yeah, whatever. He's saying like, you know, people are often wondering like, why would God do this? And it's like, it's important to realize that God's sense of humor isn't like ours. He's not satisfied with a simple gag or a joke. He needs complex irony with, you know, moral twists and implications that are staggering and beyond our, the, our mortal. And it's like moments like this where, like that, I just feel like really rings true. It's like, yeah, yeah seriously, man, yeah, what the fuck? If he's up like, there. A year like, later. <laughs> A year later, these po- poor people. Yeah, and like how like fucking dissociating must that be? Yeah, like that you acted in the movie and now it's happening to you, and it's just like this like farce, almost. like you know what I mean? Yeah, like I I don't know, man. It's I mean, and it's crazy because these these railroad workers were striking like a month ago. Yeah, yeah, and it got broken by this administration, and this is one of the rail companies. And then two more derailments have happened this week. There was a derailment in uh, Texas, one today in Detroit, mm-hmm. um, and then there was a. I think this was yesterday. Some truck in Arizona carrying like concentrated nitric acid, which just by the like, nitric acid is incredibly dangerous to breathe. Mm-hmm. You know, like the fumes, it's called fuming nitric acid, and you can see the fumes come off it. This like really, like, brutal brick color, which is, like, lung-killing shit. And this truck carrying, like... It must have carried, like, 55-gallon drums of this shit. Crashes, spills this nitric acid. It's in Arizona. It's yeah. hot. So this shit's fucking fuming. Yeah. Thank God it's in Arizona and not someplace moist, because if water, when water, you know, uh, hits nitric acid, the fumes can be much worse. Um, but... And I'm looking at this video, and you're seeing plumes of, like clearly nitrated like yeah. uh, uh uh you know uh, toxic like um what well, uh just you know, sm- uh, like not really smoke but like kind yeah, of smoke yeah. coming yeah. off of it and like you see that and you should think to yourself man that's like fucking like lung like destroying like that shit that'll like make you like cough up blood yeah and then there's just like a bunch of cops standing like 20 feet away with like yeah. no no respirators no no ppe or nothing clearly they don't know what's going on people are driving by they ended up having to shut down the entire highway Jesus. and like have a shelter in place for like you know up like over like like two miles downwind or something like that but these dudes are just like standing like 20 feet away i'm like dude if the wind changes and that shit comes towards you you're gonna be coughing up fucking blood real quick yeah yeah <laughs> dude scary man like fuming nitric acid it's like what the fuck's going on why are they like <clears throat> Maybe this shit happens way more than we think. Like, I mean, 
all of the transportation in this country is just fucking crumbling, but... Yeah. Well, that's... Just ask Ben Garrison. You sent, <laughs> Dude, me, you sent me that fucking... <laughs> <laughs> so, so uh, I'm in a group chat with Ian and Patrick, and, like, we like to send each other, like, Ben Garrison... Uh, like the really like deranged Ben Garrison ones, and nobody, none of us have sent us have sent that at all. And then like late last night, Patrick just sends that to Ian and I, and just goes, "Dude, we are so fucking back." Like, <laughs> like one of the most deranged Ben Garrison comics in yeah. like months. Dude, fucked up. <laughs> well, like, ben Garrison year, is such a fucking loser, but like, dude, his neuroses. He always makes everybody's ass so fucking big. Yeah, do you like, think he's like he's a booty guy, or do you think he's like self conscious about his ass? Like, where dude, do you think I don't, the ass I, fixation I refuse comes from? to investigate the mind of Ben Garrison. Because he he, <laughs> gives, he always used to give Donald Trump like a fatty, dude. Dude, and Hillary Clinton too. Oh She's my got God. a dumper in all of his pictures. Like he he just is all draws the biggest fucking asses on everybody. Yeah, big ju- and like and I, they're like juicy and round too. They're yeah. not like oh yeah, they're they're, they're not like they're unflattering. Ca- they're they're like fucking. Dude. They're dumpers, dude. He puts they like, are Calipigian, dude. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god, Calipigian, listen to you. Yeah. Um, no, seriously, though. So, yeah, so, I refuse to investigate the mind of Ben Garrison further. That's just a neurosis that I I do not wish to know more. Well, speaking of uh, hideous perversions of artistic expression, um, I think this is probably a good place here to you know end our intro segment. Um, we do have... Uh, some wonderful sword and sorcery ahead of you. Um, I am going to give you just the slightest of content warnings in advance. Uh, first of all, we can take no editorial uh, credit um, or blame for the contents of the episode that follows. Uh, nope. The Eye of Argon is an existing work. It's in the public domain. Um, you're welcome to find it and read along. Um, but also well, your Argon books, yeah, your texts, yeah, yeah. Um, but also there is some really like fucking demented shit, and it's important to note this was written by a seventeen or sixteen year old in nineteen seventy, um, who was probably like, you know, the the best writer in his high school English class or something. But like, he's I mean, it's dog shit, and his view of women and sexuality and everything. Um, not only is it on full display, but it's like, it's demented and it's like not okay. Yeah, it's not up to, no, up <laughs> no to fucking, I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't up to fucking code in <laughs> 1970. Like in 1970, people read this and were like, this is the weirdest, worst shit I've ever read. So yeah. like, just getting that out of the way now. So listen at your own risk. That being said, I highly recommend that you do listen. I, I have been having a lot of fun reading it and it's, uh, I think one of the funniest, worst things that I've ever read. I can't wait to listen to this. Yeah, Evan will be listening with you guys, because I've been doing the recordings of this solo. Yeah. Um, But we also have plans to kind of do more stuff like this together in the future. This is sort of just Mm -hmm. a cam project that I was working on when I was sick. And, um, yeah, so I I hope you guys enjoy. And... uh, yeah. We will uh let's leave the ris- the listeners into your capable hands and dulcet tones. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh enjoy part one of our reading of The Eye of Argon. <laughs> Without further ado, 
and any further explanation, uh, I think it's time to dive in. So this is The Eye of Argon by Jim Theus. We're going to say Theus. Uh, and I'm not really sure. I'm actually going to look here. Yeah, it doesn't look like this is <laughs> separated into chapters. So uh, I guess Jim Jim did not himself see the need for that. So I'm going to just start. The weather-beaten trail wound ahead into the dust-racked climbs of the barren land which dominates large portions of the Norgolian Empire. Age-worn hoofprints smothered by the sifting sands of time shone dully against the dust-splattered crust of the earth. The tireless sun cast its parching rays of incandescence from overhead, halfway through its daily revolution. Small rodents scampered about, occupying themselves in the daily accomplishments of their dismal lives. <laughs> Dust sprayed over three heaving mounts in blinding clouds while they bore the burdensome cargoes of their struggling overseers. This is wild. This is insane. Prepare to embrace your creators in the Stygian haunts of hell, barbarian, gasped the first soldier. Only after you have kissed the fleeting stead of death, wretch, returned Grigner. A sweeping blade of flashing steel riveted from the massive barbarian's hide-enameled shield as his rippling right arm thrust forth, sending a steel-shod blade to the hilt into the soldier's vital organs. The disemboweled mercenary crumpled from his saddle and sank to the clouded sward, sprinkling the parched dust with crimson droplets of escaping life fluid. The enthused barbarian swil swilveled about... <laughs> His shock of fiery red hair tossing robustly in the humid air currents as he faced the attack of the defeated soldier's fellow in arms. Damn you, barbarian! shrieked the soldier as he observed his comrade in death. A gleaming scimitar smote a heavy blow against the renegade's spiked helmet, bringing a heavy cloud over the accordion's misting brain. Shaking off the effects of the pounding blow to his head, Griegner brought down his scarlet-streaked edge against the soldier's crudely forged hauberk, clanging harmlessly to the left side of his opponent. The soldier's stead, steed, steed, he wrote stead, whinnied as he directed the horse back from the driving blade of the barbarian. Grigner leashed his mount forward as the hoarsely piercing, hoarsely piercing battle cry of his wilderness-bred race resounded from his grinding lungs. A twirling blade bounced harmlessly from the mighty thief's buckler as his rolling right arm cleft upward, sending a foot of blinding steel ripping through the Cimmerian's exposed gullet. A gasping gurgle from the soldier's writhing mouth as he tumbled to the golden sand at his feet and wormed agonizingly in his deathbed. <laughs> Jesus. <laughs> Grigner's emerald green orbs <laughs> glared lustfully at the wallowing soldier struggling before his chestnut swirled mount. His scowling voice reverberated over the dying form in a tone of mocking mirth. You city bred dogs should learn not to antagonize your better. Reining his weary mount ahead, Grigner resumed his journey to the Nor 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 Norigolian. I, n I don't know. I'm going to be honest with you guys. I don't know if he's. I think he has forgotten how to spell... Whatever. The Norigolian city of Gorzam, hoping to discover wine, women, and adventure to boil the wild blood coursing through his savage veins. The trek to Gorzam was forced upon Grigner when the soldiers of Kryn were unleashed upon him by a faithless concubine he had wooed. His scandalous activities throughout the Sumerian city had unleashed throngs of havoc and uproar among its refined patricians, leading them to tack a heavy reward over his head. He had barely managed to escape through the back entrance of the inn he had been guzzling in as a squad of soldiers tounced upon him. After spilling a spout of blood from the leader of the mercenaries as he dismembered one of the officer's arms, he retreated to his mount to make his way towards Gorzom, rumored to be rumored to contain hordes of plunder and many young wenches for any man who has the backbone to wrest them away. And I lied. It looks like it is spread into chapters. That was the conclusion of chapter one. Uh, and we will now commence with chapter two. 
Arriving after dusk in Gorzom, Grigner descended upon a dismal alley, reining his horse before a beaten tavern. The red-haired giant strode into the dimly lit hostelry, reeking of foul odors and cheap wine. The air was heavy with choking fumes spewing from smoldering torches, one word, encased within Thedon's earthen-packed walls. The dens? The dens earthen-packed walls. Tables were clustered with groups of drunken thieves and cutthroats, tossing dice or making love to willing prostitutes. Eyeing a slender female crouched alone at a nearby bench, Grigner advanced, wishing to wholesomely occupy his time. <laughs> That's fucking awesome. I am going to now refer to coitus as a wholesome occupation of time. The flickering torches cast weird shafts of luminescence dancing over the half-naked harlot of his choice, her stringy orchid twines of hair swaying gracefully over the lithe, opaque nose as she raised a half-drained mug to her pale red lips. Glancing upward, the alluring complexion noted the stalwart giant as he rapidly approached. A faint glimmer sparked from the pair of deep blue ovals of the amorous female as she motioned toward Grigner, enticing him to join her. The barbarian seated himself upon a stool at the wench's side, exposing his body, naked save for a loincloth brandishing a long steel broadsword, an iron spiraled battle helmet, and a thick leather, san a thick leather sandals to her unobstructed view. "'Thou hast need to occupy your time, barbarian?' questioned the female. Only if something worth offering is within my reach, stated Grigner, as his hands crept to embrace the tempting female who welcomed them with open willingness. From where do you come, barbarian, and by what are you called? gasped the complying wench, as Grigner smothered her lips with the blazing touch of his flaming mouth. <laughs> the engrossed titan ignored the queries of the inquisitive female, pulling her towards him, and crushing her sagging nipples to his yearning chest. Without struggle, she gave in, winding her soft arms around the harshly bronze hide of Grigner, of Grigner corded shoulder blades as his calloused hands caressed her firm, protruding busts. You make love well, wench, admitted Grigner as he reached for the vessel of potent wine his charge had been quaffing. A flying foot caught the mug Grigner had taken hold of, sending its blood-red contents sloshing over a flickering crescent, leashing tongues of bright orange flame to the foot-trodden floor. "'Remove yourself, sirrah! The wench belongs to me!' blabbered a drunken soldier, too far consumed by the influences of his virile brew to take note of the superior size of his adversary." Grigner lively bounded from the startled female, his face lit up to an ashen-red ferocity, and eyes locked in a searing, feral blaze towards the swaying soldier. "'To hell with you, braggart!' bellowed the angered accordion as he hefted his finely honed broadsword. The staggering soldier clumsily reached towards the pommel of his dangling sword, <laughs> but before his hands ever touched the oaken hilt, a silvered flash was slicing the heavy air. The thews of the savage's lashing right arm bulged. The thews? What the fuck are those? The thews of the savage's lashing right arm bulged from the glistening bronzed hide as his blade bit deeply into the soldier's neck, loping off the confused head of his senseless tormentor. Uh, side note here. I'm doing my best to read uh, phonetically from what's written here. Um, so don't read too far into anything that sounds like a a non-existent word or a mispronunciation on my part. Uh, I'm, I'm trying to faithfully uh, recreate the material for you guys. With a nauseating thud, the severed oval toppered t toppled to the floor. This guy really loves describing body parts as, like, shapes, you know, orbs and ovals and stuff. As the, segregate the segregated torso of Grigner's bovine antagonist swayed, then collapsed in a pool of swirled crimson. In the confusion, the soldier's fellows confronted Grigner with unsheathed cutlasses directed towards the latter's scowling makeup. The slut should have picked his quarry more carefully, roared the victor. <laughs> 
in a mocking baritone growl as he wiped his dripping blade on the prostrate form and returned it to its scabbard. The fool should have shown more prudence. However, you shall rue your actions while rotting in the pits, stated one of the sprawled soldier's comrades. Grigner's hand began to remove his blade from its leather housing, but retarded the motion in face of the blades waving before his face. Dismiss your hand from the hilt, barbarian, or you shall find a foot of steel sheathed in your gizzard. Grigner weighed his position, observing his plight, whereupon he took the soldier's advice as the only logical choice. To attempt to hack his way from his present predicament could only warrant certain death. He was of no mind to bring upon his own demise if an alternate path presented itself. The will to necessitate his life forced him to yield to the superior force in hopes of a moment of carelessness later upon the part of his captors, in which he could effect a more plausible means of escape, which, frankly, is very smart of Grigner. You may steady your arms. I will go without a struggle. Your decision is a wise one, yet perhaps you would have been better off had you faced death. The soldier's mouth wrinkled to a sadistic grin of knowing mirth as he prodded his prisoner on with his sword point. After an indiscriminate period of marching through slinking alleyways and dim moonlighted streets, the procession confronted a massive seraglio. Seraglio? Hmm. The palace area was surrounded by an iron grating with a lush garden upon all sides. The group was admitted through the gilded gateway, and Grigner was led, was led along a stone pathway, bordered by plush vegetation lustfully enhanced by the moon's shimmering rays. Upon reaching the palace, the group was granted entrance, and after several minutes of explanation, led through several winding corridors to a richly draped chamber. Confronting the group was a short, stocky man seated upon a golden throne. Tapestries of richly draped regal blue silk covered all walls of the chamber, while the steps leading to the throne were plated with sprinkling white ivory. The man upon the throne had a naked wench seated at each of his arms, and a trusted advisor seated in back of him. At each corn were of the chamber, a guard stood at attention, with upraised pikes supported in their hands, golden chainmail adorning their torsos, and barred helmets emitting scarlet plumes and shrouding their heads. The man rose from his throne to the dais surrounding it, his plush turquoise robe dangled loosely from his chunky frame. The soldiers surrounding Grigner fell to their knees with heads bowed to the stone masonry of the floor in fearful dignity to their sovereign liege. Explain the purpose of this intrusion upon my chateau. Your serenity, resplendent in noble grandeur, we have brought this yokel before you, the soldier gestured toward Grigner, for the redress of your all-knowing wisdom and judgment regarding his fate. Down on your knees, lout, and pay proper homage to your sovereign, commanded the pudgy noble of Grigner. By the surly mark of Mrifk, Grigner kneels to no man. <laughs> By the surly beard of Mrifk, Grigner kneels to no man, scowled the massive barbarian. You dare to deal this blasphemous act to me? You are indeed brave, stranger, yet your valor smacks of foolishness. I find you to be the only fool, sitting upon your pompous throne, enhancing the rolling flabs of your belly in the midst of your elaborate, elaborate luxury, and... The soldier standing at Grigner's side smote him heavily in the face with the flat of his sword, cutting short the harsh words and knocking his battered helmet to the masonry with an echoing clang. The paunchy noble's sagging round face flushed suddenly pale, then hastily lit up to a lustrous cherry-red radiance. His lips trembled with malicious rage while emitting a muffled, sibilant gibberish. <laughs> His sagging flabs rolled like a tub of upset jelly, <laughs> <coughs> then compressed as he sucked in his gut in an attempt to conceal his softness. The prince regained his statue, then spoke to the soldiers surrounding Grigner, his face conforming to an ugly expression of sadistic humor. Take this uncouth heathen to the vault of misery, and be sure that his agonies are long and drawn out before death can release him. As you wish, sire. Your command shall be heeded immediately, answered the soldier on the right of Grigner as he stared into the barbarian's seemingly unaffected face. 
The advisor seated in the back of the noble slowly rose and advanced to the side of his master, motioning the wenches seated at his sides to remove themselves. He lowered his head and whispered to the noble, Eminence, the punishment you have decreed will cause much misery to this scum, yet it will last only a short time, then release him to a land beyond the sufferings of the human body. Why not mellow him in one of the subterranean vaults for a few days, then send him to life labor in one of your buried mines? To one such as he, a life spent in the confinement of the Stygian pits will be an infinitely more appropriate and lasting torture. The noble cupped his drooping double chin in the folds of his briming palm, meditating for a moment upon the rationality of the counselor's words, then raised his shaggy brown eyebrows and turned towards the advisor, eyes aglow. As always, Ag Agafund, <laughs> you speak with great wisdom. Your words ring of great knowledge concerning the nature of one such as he, saith the king. I guess he's a king now. The noble turned toward the prisoner with a noticeable shimmer reflecting in his frog-like eyes and his lips contorting to a greasy grin. I have decided to void my previous decree. The prisoner shall be removed to one of the palace's underground vaults. There he shall stay until I have decided that he has sufficiently simmered, whereupon he is to be allowed to spend the remainder of his days at labor in one of my mines. Upon hearing this, Grigner realized that his fate would be far less merciful than death to one such as he, who was used to roaming the countryside at will. A life of confinement would be more than his body and mind could stand up to. This type of life would be immeasurably worse than death. I shall never understand the ways if your twisted civilization. I simply defend my honor and am condemned to life confinement by a pig who sits on his royal ass wooing whores and knows nothing of the affairs of the land he imagines to rule. Lectures, Grigner? <laughs> That's a weird place for a question mark. Enough of this. Away with the slut before I lose my control. So this is the second time that this guy, this writer, has used slut as just like a like a blanket insult. Uh, people are just calling each other sluts willy-nilly in Norgol Norgolian, Norgolod, whatever this fucking empire is called. Seeing the peril of his position, Grigner searched for an opening. Crushing prudence to the sword, he plowed into the soldier at his left arm, taking hold of his sword and bounding to the dais supporting the prince before the startled guards could regain their composure. Agafond leaped Grigner and his sire but found a sword blade permeating the length of his ribs before he could loose his weapon. The counselor slumped to his knees as Grigner slid his crimsoned blade from Agafond's ribcage. The fat prince stood undulating in insurmountable fear before the edge of the fiery-maned comet, his flabs of jellied blubber pulsating to and fro in ripples of flowing terror. <laughs> Where is your wisdom and power now, your majesty? <laughs> growled Grigner. <laughs> the prince went rigid as Grigner, discerning him, glazed over his shoulder. Wow, okay. He, he slived to note the cause of the noble's attention, raised his sword over his head, and prepared to leash a vicious downward cleft, but fell short as the heft of a steel-rhymed pike clashed against his unguarded skull. Then, blackness and solitude, silence and shrouding and ever peaceful reigned supreme. Before me, Sarah, before me as always, ha, 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 Nobly cackled. <laughs> That's the end of chapter two. Chapter three. Consciousness returned to Grigner in stigmatic, stigmatic pools as his mind gradually cleared of the cobwebs cluttering its inner recesses. Yet the Stygian cloud of charcoal ebony remained an incompatible shield of blackness, enhanced by the bleak absence of sound. Grigner's muddled brain reeled from the shock of the blow he had received to the base of his skull. The events leading to his predicament were slow to filter back to him. He dickered with the notion that he was dead and had descended or sunk, however it may be, to the shadowed land beyond the aperture of the grave, but rejected this hypothesis when his memory sifted back within his grips. 
This was not the land of the dead. It was something infinitely more precarious than anything the grave could offer. Death promised an infinity of peace, not the finite misery of an inactive life of confirmed torture, forever concealed from the life-bearing shafts of the beloved rising sun. <laughs> the orb that had been before taken for granted, yet now cherished above all else. Again with the orbs. Orbs and, 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 what does he say? Orbs and, I don't remember. <laughs> To be forever refused further glimpses of the snow-capped summits of the land of his birth, never again to witness the thrill of plundering unexplored lands beyond the crest of a bleeding horizon, and perhaps worst of all the denial to ever again encompass the lustful excitement of caressing the naked curves of the body of a trim yun yund wench. <laughs> this was indeed one of the buried chasms of hell concealed within the inner depths of the palace's despised interior, a fearful ebony chamber devised to drive to the brinks of insanity the minds of the unfortunately condemned through the inept solitude of a limbo of listless, dreary silence. That concludes chapter three. We are now on to chapter three and a half. A tightly rung elliptical circle of or torches cast their wavering shafts prancing morbidly over the smooth surface of a rectangular, ridged altar. Expertly chiseled forms of grotesque gargoyles graced the oblique rim, protuberating the length of the grim orifice of death, staring forever ahead. There's a lot of run-on sentences here. Staring forever ahead into nothingness in complete ignorance of the bloody rites enacted in their presence. Brown, flaking stains decorated the golden surface of the ridge surrounding the altar, which banked to a small slit at the lower right-hand corner of the altar. The slit stood above a crudely pounded pail, which had several silver-meshed chalices hanging at its sides. Dangling at the rim of golden mallet, uh, the handle of which was engraved with images of twisted faces and groved at its far end with slots designed for a snug hand grip. The head of the mallet was slightly larger than a clenched fist and shaped into a smooth oval mass. The ins uh, encircling the marble altar was a congregation of leering sh shaman. Eerie chants of a bygone age, originating unknown eons before the memory of man, were being uttered from the buried recesses of the acolytes' deeplings. The acolytes' deeplings? Orange paint was smeared in generous globules over the tops of the priests' wrinkled, shaven scalps, while golden rings projected from the lobes of their pink ears. Ornate robes of lush, lush, I think luscious, purple satin enclosed their bulging torsos, attached around their waists with silvered silk lashes latched with ebony buckles in the shape of morose, misshaped skulls. Dangling around their necks were oval-fashioned medallions held by thin gold chains, featuring in their centers blood-red rubies which resembled crimson fetish eyeballs. Can you guys picture this scene? Because I feel like I'm there. Cushioning their bare feet were plush-red felt slippers with pointed golden spikes projecting from their tips. Situated in front of the altar and directly adjacent to the copper pail was a massive jade idol, a misshaped, hideous bust of the shaman's pagan deity. The shimmering green idol was placed in a sitting posture on an ornately carved golden throne raised upon a round, divery-plated dais, uh, probably ivory, its bulging arms and webbed hands resting on the padded arms of the seat. Its head was entwined in golden snake-like coils hanging over its oblong ears, which tapered off to thin, hollow points. Its nose was a bulging triangular mass, sunken in at its sides with toe-gaping nostrils. Dramatic beneath the nostrils was a twisted, shaggy-lipped mouth, giving the impression of a slovering, sadistic grimace. At the foot of the heathen deity, a slender, pale-faced female, 
naked Oof, had to had to, she had to be naked but for a golden jeweled harness enshrouding her huge outcropping breasts supporting long silver laces which extended to her thigh stood before the pearl the pearl white field with noticeable shivers traveling up and down the length of her exquisitely molded body this dude was horny as shit this guy was so goddamn horny it's 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 unbelievable to me her delicate lips trembled beneath so- <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Her delicate lips trembled beneath soft, narrow hands as she attempted to conceal herself from the piercing stare of the ambivalent idol. Glaring directly down towards her was the stony, cycloptic face of the bloated deity. Gaping from its single obling obling oblong, probably, socket was scintillating many faceted scarlet emerald, a brilliant gem seeming to possess a life all of its own. A priceless gleaming stone capable of domineering the wealth of conquering empires. The eye of Argon. Fuck yeah. This is the first time that we've encountered uh the eponymous eye of Argon in our narrative, so I feel like you should really make note of us. This, this, of course, concludes chapter three and a half. Chapter four. All knowledge of measuring time had escaped Grigner. When a person is deprived of the sun, moon, and stars, he loses all conception of time as he had previously understood it. It seemed as if years had passed, if time were being measured by terms of misery and mental anguish, yet he estimated that his stay had only been a few days in length. So, okay, so not all knowledge of measuring time has escaped Grigner. He's making a pretty solid estimate here. He has slept three times and had been fed five times since his awakening in the crypt. However, when the actions of the body are restricted, its needs are also affected. The need for nourishment and slumber are directly proportional to the functions the body has performed, meaning that when free and active Grigner may have become hungry every six hours and witness the desire for sleep every 15 hours, whereas in his present condition, he may encounter the need for food every 10 hours and the want for rest every 20 hours. All methods he had before depended upon were extinct in the dismal pit. Great. Hence, he may have been imprisoned for 10 minutes or 10 years. He did not know, resulting in a disheartened emotion deep within his being. Now, I think that's a bit of an ex- exaggeration. I... I think 10 minutes or 10 years, it's definitely somewhere in between. The food, if you can honor the moldering lumps of fetid mush to that extent, was borne to him by two guards who opened a portal at the top of his enclosure and shoved it to him in wooden bowls, retrieving the food and water bowls from his previous meal at the same time, after which they threw back the bolts on the iron latch and returned to their other duties. Since deprived of all other means of nourishment, Grigner was impelled to eat the tainted slop in order to ward off the pangs of starvation, though as he stuffed it into his mouth with his filthy fingers and struggled to force it down his throat, this is uh, is the weirdest boner I've ever had, he imagined it was that which had been spurned by the hounds stationed at various segments of the palace. There was little in the barren vault that could occupy his body or mind. He had placed out the length and width of the enclosure Ah, he had paced out the length and width of the enclosure time and time again and tested every granite slab which consisted the walls of the prison in hopes of finding a hidden passage to freedom, all of which was to no avail other than to keep him busy and distract his mind from wandering to thoughts of what he believed was his future. He had memorized the number of strides from one end to the other of the cell, and he knew the exact number of slabs which made up the bleak dungeon. Numerous schemes were introduced and alternately discarded in turn as they suckered to unravel to him no means of escape which stood the slightest chance of success. Anguish continued to mount as his means of occupation were rapidly exhausted, two separate words, suddenly with no... Suddenly with no tithe, no tithe? Suddenly, well, he's got no tithe. Suddenly with no tithe, he was routed from his contemplations as he detected a faint scratching sound at the end of the crypt opposite him. The sound seemed to be caused by something trying to scrape away at the granite blocks the floor of the enclosure consisted of, the sandy scratching of something like an animal's claws. 
Grigner gradually groped his way to the other end of the vault, carefully feeling his way along with his hands ahead of him. When a few inches from the wall, a loud, penetrating squeal and the scampering of small padded feet reverberated from the walls of the roughly hewn chamber. Grigner threw his hands up to shield his face and flung himself backwards upon his buttocks. A fuzzy form bounded to his hairy chest, burying its talons in his flesh while gnashing towards his throat with its grinding white teeth. Its sour, fetid breath scor scorched Ching, the squirming barbarian's dilated nostrils. Grigner grappled with the lashing flexor muscles of the repugnant body of a gargantuan brown-hided rat, striving to hold its razor teeth from his juicy jugular. This dude fucking loves alliteration, and I, like, seriously, I'm here for it. Reading this feels really good. There are so many sentences in this that, you know, are obviously, like, dog shit. Like, this is clearly, like... I would guess this person's like a teenager, the person writing this. Now, that's I've done no prior research. I would guess that the person writing this uh, is a teenager, but I, I, I feel like they've managed to create some really fun sentences to read, uh, even though they sound terrible and everything feels like extremely overwrought. Uh, striving to hold its razor teeth from his juicy jugular. I mean, that just feels fucking awesome to read. <laughs> uh, as its beady gray organs of sight... <laughs> The way this guy describes eyes, too, is fucking awesome. Ovals and orbs and organs of sight. Um, as its beady gray organs of sight glazed into the flaring emeralds. <laughs> Again, <laughs> it's prey. This is, it's awesome. Like, he's probably just learned in an English class that it's like, you don't want to just say the same thing over and over again. So you don't want to say eyes, like, over and over again. But, the, I mean, the way that he's going about it is... Fan it's just fantastic. I gotta read this again. As its beady gray organs of sight glazed into the flaring emeralds of its prey. <laughs> they made eye contact. Taking hold of the rodent around its lean, growling stomach with both hands, Griegner pried it from his crimson-rent breast, removing small patches of flayed, fresh flayed flesh from his chest. Now, here's the thing. He says chest twice here. Why didn't he say, like from his rippling barrel or something. Uh, removing small patches of flayed flesh from his chest in the motion between the squalid black claws of the starving beast. Holding the rodent at arm's length, he cupped his right hand over its frothing face, contracting his fingers into a vice-like fist over the quivering head. Retraining, retra retaining his grips on the rat, Grigner flexed his outstretched arms while slowly twisting his right hand clockwise and his left hand counterclockwise motion, kind of like a what we used to call an Indian sunburn. I don't, I'm sure that there's probably a, a newer name for that, but that's what we used to call that. The rodent let out a tortured squall, drawing scarlet as its violent as it violently dug its foam flecked flangs foam-flecked fangs into the barbarian's sweating palm, causing his face to contort to an ugly grimace as he cursed beneath his breath. With a loud crack, the rodent's head parted from its squirming torso, sending out a sprinkling, sh a sprinkling shower of crimson gore and trailing a slimy string of disjointed vertebrae, snapped trachea, esophagus, and jugular, disjointed hyoid bone, morose purpled stretched hide, and blood-seared muscles. <laughs> Flinging the broken body to the floor, Grigner shook his blood-streaked hands and wiped them against his thigh until dry, then wiped the blood that had showered his face and from his eyes. Again sitting himself upon the jagged floor, he prepared to once more revamp his glum meditations. He told himself that as long as he still breathed, the gust of life through his lungs, hope was not lost. He told himself this, but found it hard to comprehend in his gloomy surroundings. Yet he was still alive, his bulging sinews at their peak of marvel, his struggling mind floating in a mural of impressed excellence of thought. Plot after plot sifted through his mind in energetic contemplations. Then it hit him. Minutes may have passed in silent thought or days, he could not tell, but he stumbled at last upon a plan that he considered as holding a slight margin of plausibility. He might die in the attempt, but he knew he would not submit without a final bloody struggle. 
It was not a foolproof plan, yet it built up a store of renewed, vortexed energy in his overwrought soul. Though he might perish in the execution of the escape, he would still be escaping the life of infinite torture in store for him. Either way, he would still cheat the gloating prince of the suckered revenge his sadistic mind craved so dearly. <laughs> the guards would soon come to bear him off to the prince's buried mines of dread, giving him the sought-after op opportunity to execute his nearly formulated plan. Groping his way along the rough floor, Grigner finally found his tool in a pool of congealed gore. The carcass of the decapitated rodent, the tool that the very filth he had been sentenced to spawned. When the time came for action, he would have to be prepared, so he set himself to rending the sticky hulk in grim silence, searching by the touch of his fingertips for the lever to freedom. Chapter 5 "'Up to the altar and be done with it, wench!' ordered a fidgeting shaman as he gave the female a grim stare accompanied by the wrinkling of his lips to a mirthful grin of delight. The girl burst into a slow, steady whimper, stooping shakily to her knees and cringing woefully from the priest with both arms wound snake-like around the bulging jade-jade shin rising before her scantily attired figure. Her face was redly inflamed from the salty flow of tears spouting from her glassy, dilated eyeballs. <laughs> With short, heavy footfalls, the priest approached the female, his piercing stare never wavering from her quivering young countenance. Halting before the terrified girl, he projected his arm outward and motioned her to arise with an upward movement of his hand. The girl's whimpering increased slightly, and she sunk closer to the floor rather than arising. The flickering torches outlined her trim build with a weird ornate glow as it cast a, a ghostly shadow, dancing in horrid waves of splendor over smoothly worn whiteness of the marble-hewn altar. The shaman's lips curled back farther, exposing a set of blackened, decaying molars which transformed his slovenly grin into a wide, greasy arc of sadistic mirth and alternately interposed into the female a strong sensation of stomach-curdling nausea. "'Have it as you will, female!' gloated the enhanced priest as he bent over at the waist, projecting his ape-like arms forward, and clasped the female's slender arms with his hairy round fists. With an inward surge of his biceps, he harshly jerked the trembling girl to her feet and smothered her salty wet cheeks with the moldy touch of his decrepit, dull red lips. All right, I guess this is going to be the, the sexual assault content warning. Frankly, if you've made it this far into the book, uh, this book is full of hideous violence and sexual depravity. Uh, and I don't really know what to tell you. It's, it's, it's gross. It's just a gross, nasty, fucking uh, puberty-fueled fantasy of some weirdo. Uh, and there's really no redeeming quality to the narrative here. Um, so anyway, we're going to press onward. The vile stench of the shaman's hot, fetid breath overcame the nauseated female with a deep, soul-searing sickness, causing her to wrench her head backwards and regurgitate a slimy, orange-white stream of swelling gore over the richly woven purple robe of the enthused acolyte. The priest's lips trembled with a malicious rage as he removed his callous paws from the girl's arms and replaced them with tightly around her undulating neck, shaking her violently to and fro. The girl gasped a tortured groan from her clamped lungs, her sea-blue eyes bulging forth from damp sockets. Cocking her right foot backwards, she leashed it desperately outwards with the strength of a demon possessed, lodging her sandaled foot squarely between the shaman's testicles. Good for her. I think in this situation, that's the first thing you should do. You should go straight for the nuts. The startled priest released his crushing grip, crimping his body over at the waist, overlooking his recessed belly, wide open in a deep chasm. Okay. 
His face flushed to a rose-red shade of crimson, eyelids fluttering wide with eyeballs protruding blindly outwards from their sockets to their outmost perimeters, while his lips quivered wildly about allowing an agonized wallow to gust forth from his breath billowed from burning lungs. His hands reached out clutching his urinary gland. <laughs> As his knees wobbled rapidly about for a few seconds, then buckled, causing the ruptured shaman to collapse in an egg-huddled mass to the granite pavement, rolling helplessly about in his agony. Now, honestly, dude, I hope you're not expecting any sympathy from 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 the reader here. Uh, it sounds like you deserved it, uh, maybe more. The pathetic screeches of the shaman groveling in dejected misery upon the hand-hewn granite-laid pavement, worn smooth by countless hours of arduous sweat and toil, a welter of ichor oozing through his clenched hands, attracted the perturbed attention of his comrades from their fetid ululations. <laughs> the actions of this, this rebellious wench bespoke the credence of an unheard-of sacrilege. <coughs> <coughs> Never before in a lost maze of untold eons had a chosen one dared to demonstrate such blasphemy in the face of the cult's idolic deity. The girl cowered in unreasoning terror, helpless in the face of the emblazoned acolyte's rage. Her orchid-tussled face smothered betwixt her bulging bosom as she shut her curled, lashed tightly hoping to open them and find herself awakening from a morbid nightmare. Yet the hand of destiny decreed her no such mercy, the antagonized pack of leering shaman converging intensely upon her prostrate form were entangled all too lividly in the grim web of reality. Shuddering from the clammy touch of the shaman as they grasped with her supple form, hands wrenching at her slender arms and legs in all directions, her bare body being molested in the midst of a labyrinth of orange smudges, purpled satin, and mangled skulls, shadowed in an eerie crimson glow. Her confused head reeled, then clouded in a mist of enshrouding ebony as she lapsed beneath the protective sheet of unconsciousness to a land peach and resign. Chapter 6 "'Take hold of this rope,' said the first soldier, "'and climb out from your pit, slut. <laughs> "'Your presence is requested in another far deeper hellhole.' <laughs> Grigner slipped his right hand to his thigh, "'concealing a small opaque object beneath the folds of the G-string "'wrapped around his waist.' <laughs> Brine wells swelled in Grigner's cold, jade squinting eyes, which, grown accustomed to the gloom of the Stygian pools of ebony engulfing him, were bedazzled and blinded by flickerering radiance cast forth by the second soldier's resin torch. <laughs> Tightly gripped in the second soldier's right hand, opposite the intermittent torch was a large double-edged axe, a long leather-wound oaken-handled transfixing the center of the weapon's iron head. Adorning the torsos of both of the sentries were thin yet sturdy hauberks, the breastplates of which were woven of tightly hemmed twines of reinforced silver braiding. Cupping the soldiers' feet were thick leather sandals, wound about their shins to two inches below their knees. Wrapped about their waists were wide satin girdles, with slender bladed poniards dangling loosely from them, the hilts of which featured scarlet-encrusted gems. Resting upon the manes of their heads and reaching midway to their brows were smooth copper morions, Spiraling the lower portion of the helmet were short, upcurved silver spikes, while a golden hump spired from the top of each bassinet. Beneath their chins wound around their necks and draping their clad shoulders dangled regal purple satin cloaks, which flowed midway to the soldier's feet. Now this guy's clearly got an eye or a, a mind for uh, outfit design in the fantasy realm. Uh, I wonder if he was not the... Um, the DM for many a a D and D campaign. That's just what this what this feels like. Somebody who like 
you know, his friends loved, like, his fucking insane D&D campaign so much that they were like, you should write a book. And he was like, yeah, definitely. And, like, that's the Eye of Argon. Um, so, yeah, this is, this is insane. Hand over hand, feet braced against the dank walls of the enclosure, huge Grigner ascended from the smoldering depths of the forlorn abyss. His swelled limbs, stiff due to the boredom of a timeless inactivity, compounded by the musty atmosphere and jagged granite protuberan against his body, craved for action. The opportunity now presenting itself served the purpose of oiling his rusty joints and honing his dulled senses. He braced himself, facing the second soldier. The sentry's stature was of wildly exaggerated in the glare of the flickering crescent cuppex in his right fist. Cupped, probably. His eyes were wide open in a slightly slanted owlish gaze, enhanced by their sinister intensity in, ooh, enhanced in their sinister intensity by the hawk bill curve of his nose and pale yellow peak of his cheeks. Place your hands behind your back, said the second soldier as he raised his axe over his right shoulder blade and cast it a wavering glance. We must bind your wrists to parry any attempts at escape. Be sure to make the knot a stout one, Broig. We wouldn't want our guests to take leave of our guidance. Broig grasped Grigner's left wrist, wrist and reached for the barbarian's right wrist. <laughs> Grigner wrenched his right arm free and swiveled swiveled to face Broig, reach beneath his loincloth with his right hand. The sentry grappled at his girdle for the sheathed dagger, but recoiled short of his intentions as Grigner right arm swept to his gorge. The soldier went limp, his bobbing eyes rolling beneath fluttering eyelids, a deep welt across his spouting gullet. Without lingering to observe the result of his efforts, Grigner dropped to his knees. The second soldier's axe cleft over Grigner's head in a blaze of silvered ferocity, severing several scarlet locks from his scalp. Coming to rest in his fellow's stomach, the iron head crashed through mail and flesh with splintering force, spilling a pool of crimsoned entrails over the granite paving. Before the sentry could wrench his axe free from his comrade's carcass, he found Grigner's massive hands clasped about his throat, choking the life from his clamped lungs. With a zealous grunt, the accordion flexed his tightly corded biceps, forcing the grim-faced soldier to one knee. The sentry plunged his right fist into Grigner's face, digging his grimy nails into the barbarian flesh. Ejaculating a curse through rasping teeth, Grigner surged the bulk of his weight forward, bowling the besieged sil soldier over upon his back. The sentry's arms collapsed to his thigh, shuddering convulsively, his bulging eyes staring blindly from a bloated, cherry-red face. Rising to his feet, Grigner shook the blood from his eyes, ruffling his surly red mane as a brush fire swaying to the nighttime breeze. Stooping over the sprawled corpse of the first soldier, Grigner retrieved a small white object from a pool of congealing gore. Snorting a gusty billow of mirth, he once more concealed the tiny object beneath his loincloth, the tediously honed pelvis bone of the broken rodent. <laughs> Returning his attention toward the second soldier, Grigner turned to the task of attiring his limbs. To move about freely through the dim recesses of the castle would require the grotesque garb of its soldiery. Utilizing the silence and stealth acquired in the untamed climbs of his childhood, Grigner slink through twisting corridors and winding stairways, lighting his way with the confis confist confisticated torch of his dispatched guardian. Knowing where his steps were leading to, Grigner meandered aimlessly in search of an exit from the chateau's dim confines. The wild blood coursing through his veins yearned for the undefiled freedom of the livid wilderness lands. Coming upon a fork in the passage, he treaked, he treaked, he treaked. Voices accompanied by clinking footfalls discerned to his sensitive ears from the left corridor. Wishing to avoid contact, Grigner veered to the right passageway. 
If acquested as to the purpose of his presence, his barbarous accent would reveal his identity, being that his attire was not that of the castle's mercenary troops. Now, I thought it... I thought it was. I thought he just put on their clothes. Oh, well. I guess not. I don't know. In grim silence, Grigner treaded down the dingily lit corridor, a stalking panther creeping warily along on padded feet. After an interminable period of wandering through the dull corridors, no gaps to break the monotony of the cold gray walls, Grigner espied a small winding stairway. Descending the flight of arced granite slabs to their posterior, Grigner was confronted by a short hallway leading to a tall arched wooden doorway. Halting before the teeming portal portal, Grigner rests his shaggy head sideways against the barrier. Detecting no sounds from within, he grasped the looped metal handle of the door, his arms surging with a tremendous effort of bulging muscles, yet the door would not bulge. Retrieving his axe from where he had sheathed it beneath his girdle, he hefted it in his mighty hands with an, appe an appeased grunt, and wedging one of its blackened edges into the crack between the portal and its iron-rhymed sill. Bracing his sandaled right foot against the rudgely hewn wall, teeth tightly clenched, Grigner apolevered the oaken haft, employing it as a lever whereby to pry open the barrier. The leather-wound hilt bending to its utmost limits of endurance, the massive portal swung open with a grating of snapped latch and rusty iron hinges. Glancing about the dust-swirled room in the gloomily danced glare of his flickering cresset, Grigner eyed evidences of the enclosure being nothing more than a forgotten storeroom. Miscellaneous articles required for the maintenance of a castle were piled in disorganized heaps at infrequent intervals toward the wall opposite the barbarian's piercing stare. Utilizing long, bounding strides, Grigner paced his way over to the mounds of supplies to discover if any articles of value were contained within their midst. Detecting a faint clinking sound, Grigner sprawled to his left side with the speed of a striking cobra, landing harshly upon his back. Torch and axe loudly clattering to the floor in a morass of sparks and flame. An elm-woven board leaped from collapsed flooring, clashing against the jagged flooring and spewing a shower of orange and yellow sparks over Grigner's startled face. Rising uneasily to his feet, the half-stunned accordion glared down at the gruesome arm of death he had unwittingly sprung. Mrifk! That's just what he says. I think that's his god. Mrifk! <laughs> if not for his keen auditory organs and light, lighting steeled reflexes, Grigner would have been groping through the shadowed hell pits of the Grim Reaper. He had unknowingly stumbled upon an ancient, long-forgotten booby trap, a mistake which would have stunted the perusal of longevity of one less agile. A mechanism, similar in type to that of a miniature catapult, was concealed be beneath two collapsible sections of granite flooring. The arm of the device was four feet long, boasting razor-like cleats at regular intervals along its face with, with, with which it was to skewer the luckless body of its would-be victim. Grigner had stepped upon a concealed catch which relaced a small metal latch beneath the two granite sections, causing them to fall inward and thereby loose the spiked arm of death they precariously held in. Partially out of curiosity and partially out of an inordinate fear of becoming a pincushion for a possible second trap, Grigner plunged his torch into the exposed gap in the floor. The floor of a second chamber stood out seven feet below the glare. Tossing his torch through the aperture, Grigner grasped the side of an adjoining tile, dropping down. So, he's trying to escape. He knows he's in the dungeon. Why is he going down? I don't know. I guess it's good because he's probably going to save this chick from the, uh, the, uh, the evil rapey priests down in the, uh, the Argon chamber. So, you know, hopefully he gets there. That being said, he's also almost definitely going to take advantage of her immediately after saving her. Um, but I guess in this world, she's probably going to be into it. So, who knows, man? I, I don't know what the morality of any of the characters involved in this is. 
Glancing about the room, Grigner discovered that he had descended into the palace's mausoleum. Rectangular stone crypts cluttered the floor at evenly placed intervals. The tops of the enclosures were plated with thick layers of virgin gold, while the sides were plated with white ivory. At one time sparkling, but now grown dingy through the passage of the rays of all-encompassing Mother Time, all-encompassing Mother Time. Featured at the head of each sarcophagus in tarnished silver was an ex- expugnissively carved likeness of its rotting inhabitant. I gotta know if that's a real word. Nah, man, I think he's just trying to say expensively. Expugnif- expugnissively. Fuck, there are so many great made-up words in this. A dingy atmosphere pervaded the air of the chamber, which sealed in the enclosure for an unknown period had grown thick and stale. Intermingling with the curdled currents was the repugnant stench of slowly moldering flesh, creeping ever slowly but surely through minute cracks in the numerous vaults. Due to the embalming of the bodies, their flesh decayed at a much slower rate than normal, yet the nauseous odor was nonetheless repellent. Towering over Grigner's head was the trap he released. The mechanism of the miniaturized catapult was cluttered with mildew and cobwebs. Notwithstanding these relics of antiquity, its efficiency remained unimpinged. To the right of the trap wound a short stairway through a recession in the ceiling, a concealed entrance leading to the mausoleum for which the catapult had obviously been erected as a silent, relentless guardian. Climbing up the side of the device, Grigner set to the task of resetting its mechanism. In the event that a search was organized, it would prove well to leave no evidence of his presence upon to wa- open to wandering eyes. Besides, it might even serve to dwindle the size of an opposing force. Descending from his perch, Grigner was startled by a faintly muffled scream of horrified desperation. His hair prickled yawkishly in disorganized clumps along his scalp, as a cold danced along the length of his spinal cord. No moral-slash-mortal barrier, human or otherwise, was capable of arousing the numbing sensation of fear inside of Grigner's smoldering soul. However, he was overwrought by the forces of the barbarian's instinctive fear of the supernatural. His mighty thews had always served to adequately conquer any tangible foe. What are thews? This is the second time he said it. Thew, muscular strength. It's an old poetic term. Muscles and tendons perceived as generating such strength. Huh. Okay, so that's a real word. His mighty thews had always served to adequately conquer any tangible foe. But the intangible was something distant and terrible. Dim, horrifying tales passed by word of mouth over glimmering campfires and skins of wine had more than once served the purpose of chilling the marrowed core of his sturdy-limbed bones. Yet, the scream continued a, contained a strangely human quality, unlike that which Grigner imagined would come from the lungs of a demon or spirit, making Grigner take short, nervous strides advancing to the sarcophagus from which the sound was issuing. Clenching his teeth in an attempt to steal his jangled nerves, Grigner slid the engraved slab from the vault with a sharp rasp of grinding stone. Another long-drawn cry of terror, infested anguish, met the barbarian, scoring like the shrill piping of a demented banshee. Piercing his inner fibers of his superstitious brain with primitive dread, 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 and awe. Some of these have to be typos. I mean, maybe this... I don't know. (laughs) a lot of repetition of words here. Stooping over to espy the tomb's contents, the glittering accordion's nostrils were singed by the scorching aroma of a moldering corpse, long shut up and fermenting. The same putrid scent which permeated the entire chamber, though multiplied to a much more concentrated dosage. The shriveled, leathery packet of crumbling bones and dried, flacking flesh offered no resistance, but remained in a fixed position of perpetual vigilance, watching over its dim abode from hollowed, gaping sockets. The tortured cries were not coming from the tomb, but from some hidden depth below. Pulling the reeking corpse from its resting place, Grigner tossed it to the floor in a broken, mangled heap. 
Upon one side of the crypt's bottom was attached a series of tiny hinges, while running parallel along the opposite side of a convex railing-like protuberance, laid so as to appear as a part of the interior surface of the sarcophagus. Raising the slab upon its bronze hinges, long removed from the gaze of human eyes, Grigner perceived a scene which caused his blood to smolder, not unlike bubbling molten lava. <laughs> Directly below him, a whimpering female lay stretched upon a smooth-surfaced marble altar. A pack of gracie faced shaman clustered around her in a tight, circular formation. Crouched over the girl was a tall, pot-bellied priest, his mouth dominated by a disgusting, open-mouthed grimace of sadistic glee. Suspended from the acolyte's clenched right hand was a carven, oval-faced mallet, which he waved menacingly over the girl's shadowed face. Never dangle your mallet over a lady's face without her consent, okay? I think we all know that better than that. It's, it's, it's 2023. An incoherent gibberish flowing from his grinning, thick-lipped mouth. In the face of the amorphous, broad-breeded bre broad female, probably breasted, stretching out alluringly before his gasping eyes, the universal whim of nature filling a plea of despair inside of his white-hot soul, Grigner acted in the only manner he could perceive. Giving vent to a hoarse, throat-rending battle cry, Grigner plunged into the midst of the startled shaman, torch simmering in his left hand and axe twirling in his right hand. A gaunt, skull-faced priest, standing at the far side of the altar, clutched desperately at his throat, coughing furiously in an attempt to catch his breath. Lurching helplessly to and fro, the acolyte pitched headlong against the gleaming base of a massive jade idol. Now, I think we've seen this idol before, but, you know, Grig Grigner has not. Writhing agonizedly against the hideous image, foam-flecking his chalk-white lips, the priest struggled helplessly, the victim of an epileptic seizure. Startled by the barbarian's stunning appearance, the chronic fit of their fellow and the fear that Grigner might be the, the avant-garde? Advanced guard, I think what they're saying. The avant-garde of a conquering force dedicated to the... Or vanguard, maybe he meant. Well, he wrote avant-garde. Uh, the avant-garde of a conquering force dedicated to the cause of destroying their degenerated cult... The Samen momentarily lost their composure. Giving vent to heedless pandemonium, the priests fell easy prey to Grigner's sweeping arc of crimsoned death and maiming destruction. The acolyte performing the sacrifice took a vicious blow to the stomach, hands clutching vitals and severed spinal cord as he sprawled over the altar. The disorganized priests lurched and staggered with split skulls, dismembered limbs, and spewing entrails before the enraged accordion's relentless onslaught. The howls of the maimed and dying reverberated against the walls of the tiny chamber. The chorus of hell fraught despair as the granite floor ran red with blood. The entire chamber was encompassed in the heat of raw, savage butchery, as Grigner luxuriated in the grips of a primitive, beastly bloodlust. Presently, all went silent save for the ebbing groans of the sinking shaman and Grigner's heavy, heaving breath accompanied by several gusty curses. The well had run dry. No more lambs remained for the slaughter. <laughs> The rampaging stead of death, having taken of Grigner for the moment, left the barbarian free to the exploitation of his other perusials. Tower over his, towering over his head was the misshaped image of the cult's hideous deity, Argon. I feel like there are going to be no more chapters. I feel like this last one has been incredibly long. Let's see. Oh no, there are more. This uh, this one's just very long. Okay. <laughs> well, we'll finish this one out here. The fantastic size of the idol in consideration of its being of pure jade was enough to cause the senses of any man to stagger and reel. Yet thus was not the case for the behemoth. He had paid only casual notice to this and incredible fact, while... 
riveting the whole of his attention upon the jewel protruding from the idol's sole socket. Its masterfully cut faucets, <laughs> emitting blinding rays of hypnotizing beauty. After all, a man cannot slink from a heavily guarded palace while burdened down by the intensive bulk of a squatting statue, providing, of course, that the idol can even be hefted, which in fact was beyond the reaches of Grigner's coursing stamina. On the other hand, the jewel, gigantic as it was, would not present a hindrance of any mean concern. Help me, please. I can make it well worth your while, pleaded a soft, anguish-strewn voice wafting over Grigner's shoulders as he plucked the dull red emerald from its roots. Turning, Grigner faced the female that had lured him into this bloodbath, but whom had become all but forgotten in the heat of the battle. You! ejaculated the accordion in a pleased tone. I thought that I had seen the last of you at the tavern, but verily I was mistaken. Grigner advanced into the grips of the female's entrancing stare, severing the golden chains that held her captive upon the altar's highly polished face of ornamental limestone. So apparently this is the same girl that was like hammered in the tavern and I guess got, got him into this situation in the first place. I don't know. As Grigner lifted the girl from the altar, her arms wound dexterously about his neck, soft and smooth against his harsh exterior. Art thou pleased that we <laughs> Art thou pleased that we have chance to meet once again? Grigner merely voiced a and sighed grunt, returning the damsel's embrace while he smothered her trim, delicate lips between the coursing protrusions of his reeking maw. <laughs> Oh, my God. Let us take leave of this wretched chamber, stated Grigner, as he placed the female upon her feet. She swooned a moment, causing Grigner to give her her support, then regained her stance. Art thou able to find your way through the accursed passages of this castle? Mrifk! Every one of the corridors of this damned place are identical. I... I was at one time a slave of Prince Agafim. His clammy touch sent a sour swill through my belly, but my efforts reaped a harvest. I gained the pig's liking, whereby he allowed me the freedom of the palace. It was through this means that I eventually managed escape of the palace. It was a simple matter to seduce the sentry at the western gate. His trust found him with a dagger thrust in his ribs, the wench stated, wh <laughs> Whimsicorically? <laughs> Again, is this a real word? Whimsicorically. Nope. <laughs> Whimsicorically. All right. What were you doing at the tavern whence I discovered you? Asked Grigner as he lifted the female through the opening into the mausoleum. I had sought to lay low from the palace's guards as they conducted their search for me. The tavern was seldom frequented by the palace guards, and my identity was unknown to the common soldiers. It was through the disturbance that you caused that the, that the palace guards were attracted to the tavern. I was dragged away shortly after you were escorted to the palace. What are you called by, female? Carthina, daughter of Mincardos, Duke of Barwigo, <laughs> whose lands border along the northwestern fringes of Gorzam. I was paid as homage to Agafim upon his thirty-eighth year, husked the femme. <laughs> and I am called a barbarian, <laughs> grunted Grigner in a disgusted tone. Oh, it's more like, and I am called a barbarian, <laughs> grunted Grigner in a disgusted tone. I guess he's like really bothered by the idea that she would like be given as tribute. I don't know. He didn't seem very progressive until now, but... Apparently, that's not something barbarians do. Aye, the ways of our civilization are in many ways warped and distorted. But what is your calling? She queried bustily. <laughs> Grigner of Ecordia. Ah, I have heard vaguely of Ecordia. It is the hill country to the far east of the Noragolian Empire. I have also heard Agafim curse your land more than once when his troops were routed in the unaccustomed mountains and gorges, saith she. Aye, my people are not tarnished by petty luxuries and baubles. I mean, the dude is stealing a big jewel, but whatever. 
They remain fierce and unconquerable in their native claims. After reaching the hidden panel at the head of the stairway, Grigner was at a loss in regard to his oper- to its operation. His fiercest heaves were as pebbles against burnished armor. Carthena depressed a small symbol included within the elaborate design upon the panel where, where open, it slowly slid into a cleft in the wall. How did you come to be the victim of those crazed shaman? Quested Grigner as he escorted Carthena through the piles of rummage on the left side of the trap. By Afim, by Afim's orders, I think Agafim, by Afim's orders, I was thrust into a secluded cell to await his passing of sentence. By some means, the priests of Argon acquired a set of keys to the cell. They slew the guard placed over me and abducted me to the chamber in which you chanced to come upon the Skostik. The Skostik sacrifice? What the fuck does Skostik mean? Nothing. I've never seen any of these words. He's just making shit up. This is wild. Their hell-spawned cult demands a sacrifice once every three moons upon its full journey through the heavens. They were startled by your unannounced appearance through the fear that you had been sent by Agaphim. The prince would surely have submitted to them the most ghastly of tortures if he had ever discovered their unfaithfulness to Sargon, his bastard deity. <laughs> Okay, so they're the priests of Argon. Agafim worships Sargon. Okay. Many of the partakers of the ritual were high nobles and high trustees of the inner palace. Agafim's pitiless wrath would have been unparalleled. They have no more to fear of Agafim now, bellowed Grigner in a deep, mirthful tone, a gleeful smirk upon his face. I have seen that they were delivered from his vengeance. (laughs) Engrossed by Carthena's graceful stride and conversation, Grigner failed to take note of the footfalls rapidly approaching behind him. As he swung aside the arched portal linking the chamber with the corridors beyond, a maddened, blood-lusting screech reverberates from his eardrums. Seemingly utilizing the speed of thought, Grigner swiveled to face his unknown foe. With gaping eyes and widened jaws, Grigner raised his axe above his surly mane, but he was too late.
Did you enjoy part one of the Eye of Argon, dear listener? Yeah, I hope you guys liked it. Um, Was it sensual? And you know what's funny? I I don't know exactly where I'm going to cut off, so I'm not going to make any reference here to what point in the story you're at, but... (laughs) Hey, wow, how about that, huh? You have, ju- you have just finished part one of The Eye of Argon, a left on red tale. <laughs> yeah, left on red, public by, domain left on red, just read by. Left on red. <laughs> yeah, it's not by, not by. Again, it's not by. As we said we beforehand, didn't. we didn't write this. <laughs> this is not. Once again, not by, left on red, <laughs> just featuring. Yeah, just, just brought to you by, yeah, presented, presented by, by. left yeah. on red, public domain theater. Um yeah. So yeah, there will be more to come, um, and I hope you guys enjoyed it, and uh, yeah, let us know if there's any other uh, weird public domain shit that yeah, you... Yeah, some good shit. If you, if you can think of any weird public domain shit that you would like to hear Evan and I put on, uh, you know, semi, semi-professional semi amateur productions of, yeah. um, I think this is kind of a fun idea, especially for weeks like right now where we both have so much on our plate, like yeah. personally, but also for this show um yeah because there's some really cool shit coming up so mm-hmm. uh yeah let us know because this stuff's a lot easier and kind of more fun to to sink our teeth into um yep. ev is there anything that you want to close with anything that you want to add before we well uh, you did mention before we recorded about ufos you want to talk about the aliens oh yeah i mean i don't know i i just think that it's interesting uh i'm i'm actually planning also after my next episode to do an episode on ufos and we'll talk a little bit about the chinese spy balloons um in that <laughs> yeah, the spy balloons <laughs> right yeah i love i mean that's just what they're known as in the in the public yeah uh yeah discourse Let, right I, now but. I, I would like to i would like to put my personal uh views no, no you can include me right, in this too, right I, now i think i'm okay with you. good if you believe that the Chinese are spying with a balloon, you have a room temperature IQ, and you should probably present yourself for a lobotomy now because you shouldn't even be allowed to live on your own. Yeah. It's, it's... You can't steer a balloon. <laughs> they're balloons, and China has satellites. Right. If you think they're using balloons as opposed to high-def cameras on satellites to spy, you should probably not even be allowed to go grocery shopping for yourself. <laughs> like, I mean, it would be it would be interesting. So I think that it's pretty you obvious. Can't steer it. Like. No, yeah. I mean, at the at the very most. Okay, so here's the thing. Say those balloons are Chinese. At at most, it's what just something to oh. take like ambient atmospheric readings. Weather, <laughs> right? So like, the, and so, so the best... and so, what are they not allowed to know? What the temperature is like here? So here's the best part: the, like, the I... White House released a statement yesterday saying. That some of the balloons were most likely civilian. Yeah, which oh, means so that's that they the were just thing. shooting down like fucking university weather balloons. Like, like this is like the dumbest fucking mass. This is such a 2023 American mass hysteria where you just have a bunch of fucking trigger happy fucking top head, uh, top head, top gun goons who are just fucking lighting up. Like university well, balloons. So here's the thing, and I was thinking about this today. It's it must be a really nerve wracking time for hot air balloon enthusiasts. Uh, yeah. And like I'm just like picturing like a moment where it's like, you know, some guy out in the Midwest where they do that. He's they in have, his balloon. He's getting ready, and he hasn't gone up phone. in a while. And like yeah. his wife is like. Don, are you sure you're gonna do this? And he's like, "Listen here, Martha. We can't just let them rule our lives like this forever. I so love he, ballooning, and I'm going up in old best." And then he like kisses they don't her. Don't call me ballooning, Bill Hayworth, for nothing. <laughs> right. And so, so old as he cuts the last cord, he gets a Google alert that says that the U.S. has shot down a third balloon, and he's just like, "Well, shit." <laughs> As he's just sailing into the air yeah. above like fucking New Mexico or something like that. He's already let all of his sandbags go and it's yeah. just, it's you know it's 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 time to time to prove whether you're serious about he, the hobby. He hears a scrambling jet in the distance. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah it was just fucking shredded by a fucking Hellcat. Um yeah. <laughs> <laughs> should no call call should no call just an F-35 goes an F-35 goes to shoot him down but gets the slightest cross breeze and just peels apart at the panels yeah <laughs> um anyway uh so yeah I don't I don't I don't think we need to go too far into like the UFO thing but um just you know wanted to say like it's, it's everybody fucking calm down like there's although there's uh, always- as a precaution I have been wearing my X-Files crew neck 
a mm-hmm. lot, just to let the aliens know I approve of their invasion if they're real. Yeah, I mean, I, I think most people take they stock in me. the idea that, like, if well, of course you'd let them probe you. I, I, I wouldn't say no. No. Think of, I mean, what do you want to be the one guy at the party who said no to getting probed? Yeah. You know I'm I mean? all just like rubbing my my butt like up against them. You know what I mean? <laughs> Hoping that they probe me. You guys can look inside Ooh, me if you want me. to. Excuse you can I put anything in me. I didn't see you there, Mister Alien. <laughs> What's that in your hand? I didn't expect a little green man <laughs> oh. to have such a big. I don't know. Whatever. So big green hand. Yeah, little green <laughs> man with a big green hand. <laughs> little um, green man with a big green hand. Now cough. <laughs> <laughs> Is it um, good all right, for you, so, Mr. Gray? So, if it's aliens, it will probably save us from ourselves because... Yeah, know. they're probably just coming down here and be like, all right, y'all are... Can you imagine? Enough. That would actually be awesome. So, you know how, like, in... They're there's, like Vulcans? <laughs> there's, like, this, like, running thing. No, because I feel like Vulcans wouldn't work. They're like Vulcans. They're benevolent. But they're like, okay, we have to... We have to declare war on them because war is their, oh, the only language war. they know. And so, but so here's the thing. Their end goal is to make us, you know, resolve our differences and become a peaceful yep. utopia. But they understand that, like, the only language that we speak as a species is, like, aggression and violence. So yeah. rather than, like, come down and, like, petition us and, like, have us, like, just not understand it, they, like, declare war on us. But on their end, it's like a flower war from the Aztecs. And, like, they know yeah. that they're not fighting to conquer the planet. They're, like, doing just enough to make us scared so that, they, that we think they are. And then yeah. they bring peace to the planet that way. You know what I mean? Yeah. It's like a benevolent, intentioned war. Well, I also think it's funny, like, so, like, if this were to be aliens and the UFOs, and we're just shooting them down on site, like, it's on site with these aliens. Yeah. It reminds me of, so, like, Star Trek First Contact. It has, uh, it shows the, the time when Vulcans make first contact with, uh, with humans. Yeah. Which is after, like, a big world war. And then there's an episode of Star Trek Enterprise where it's a parallel universe where humans are called, like, Terrans, and they're, like, insanely bloodthirsty. <laughs> And it shows that scene from First Contact where the Vulcan just puts up his hand for, like, the live long and prosper thing. Yeah. And a human just walks up and just blows him away with a shotgun. <laughs> oh, my God. And I'm just thinking, like, that's, like, exactly what we'd be doing. Like, the a- aliens coming down to say hi and we're just, like, fucking scrambling jets and blowing them out of the sky. Yeah. Immediately. Yeah, man. It would be it would be something. I think there's I think there's some really cool movie ideas there, though. You know? Yeah. You know what would be a cool movie idea? It would be like, you know, the aliens land <clears throat> and they're like, there's like a ground war, right? There's like an invasion. We're fighting the aliens. And it would be a cool the movie to show from like. From the center of the earth. Well, it would be, a cool movie would be, like, yeah. A cool <laughs> movie would be like to show like when they reach like Sinaloa. You know what yeah. I mean? And like what happens when like the Sinaloa cartel goes up against fucking yeah. Greys. I just or think that'd be a hell of a movie. They end up at some like Colombian conflict and. Yeah, <laughs> the, uh, what do they call it? Colombian folk art. What? That's what they call like uh like the Colombian like uh narco terrorism when they just like mutilate bodies and leave them. Oh, but just in, in certain ways. Sure. Colombian folk art. Yeah, that's what the DEA called it. Interesting. Fucking DEA. Anyway, um, thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed the show today, and this was kind of a cool departure for us, something we haven't really done before. Yep. But uh, yeah, we're interested in doing some more interesting kind of dramatic shit so let us know and uh i don't know we'll see you soon let us know if you like it yeah don't tell us if you don't though because all my feelings will be hurt yeah you can tell me <laughs> no i'm just kidding you can tell me too i won't give a shit and all right guys i'll tell kim yeah tell evan and you don't don't worry he always lets me down easy <laughs> yo they think you're fucking stupid as shit <laughs> yo dude yo dude you suck and they think yo, your this shit guy sucks. said you got you sound like a fart yo this he dude said you sound like beans. a fart bro yeah <laughs> all right man you guys have a great day we'll talk to you later bye